Hello everybody and welcome. Of course I'm taking off my mask because we are here in the UK and we are, of course, continuing to quarantine and social distance. Uh, welcome to the BISC and thanks for joining us today. I've been asked by the Queen's events team to remind you that this session will be recorded. So if you maintain in the session, that is providing consent to your being. Uh, we are here at the Bader International Study Centre, that is a UK campus of Queen's University, and I'm here to talk a little bit about BISC 100, which is a core course that we offer here in the UK, and give a demonstration lesson of that class. Um, the BISC 100 is a course that takes the skills of history, geography, sociology, film and media studies, and combines those different research methods into a single course to ask and answer the questions, who are we and where do we come from? In this course, we begin with the castle itself, Hurstman Sioux Castle, where the program is developed and uh, presented from. And we go through time from the medieval period until the present moving outwards geographically as we consider questions of why do we believe the things we believe? How do historians know the things about the past that they say they know? And how does landscape communicate to us? And how do we store these ideas in text? So in this course, we use quite a lot of primary research that is using uh, artifacts from databases and archives to read and understand the past and the present. So I'm going to take a minute. I have a video queued up where I have recorded myself <clears throat> introducing the course concept in front of our castle. So if I could take a second to introduce me uh, then over there, telling us about what we're going to do here now, Duncan, can you please just roll the video? Hello and welcome to the BISC 100, the online course brought to you by the Bader International Study Centre here at Hurstman Sioux Castle in East Sussex. Yes, Queen's has a castle and this is it. In this course, we're going to combine the disciplines of history, geography, sociology, film and media studies, language, literature and culture, and a little bit of drama to see how different disciplines handle their material and understand the truth, how they all use different methods. In this week, week one, we are looking at history, the castle, and how historians build their knowledge. Yes, it's an interesting question. How do historians know what they're talking about? How do they understand the past? What are the texts they use? What are the methods they use? What are the devices they use to understand the historical past? So stick with me this week as we piece together a portrait of this castle and a historical method. Welcome to week one. So, um, we have this beautiful site, and in this lecture today, we're going to use the castle in the medieval period and some historical artifacts to demonstrate the method we use in this course and hopefully give you a little bit of understanding of the history of Queen's Medieval Castle. So, for the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to provide a short lecture with uh, primary sources. We're going to use a map of the castle. We're going to use a couple of medieval maps. And we're going to use those to understand what the terrain was like, what life was like, and what the experience was like of life as a medieval peasant or lord. So we're going to start with the lord. So I'm going to ask Duncan, who has my PowerPoint queued up, to get us started. And here we go. So in this short lecture, we're going to be working with primary sources, and we're going to put our principal focus on life for the medieval peasant. Now, Christopher Hibbert 
tells us it's easy to know what life was like for a lord because there's lots of records of lords now why would that be well they have money power and influence and when you have money you tend to buy stuff and when you buy stuff you kind of need records of it uh, the person who's selling the stuff wants their money and they might give you an invoice and we have a tendency to think of the past as somehow less sophisticated than the present but of course it was an incredibly sophisticated system of ownership and titles and so lords have all kinds of records about what their lives might have been like we can look at bills of sale accountancy documents uh, the castle had a bursar who would have been uh, keeping track of the annual expenditure of the castle and that means keeping track of exactly how much food was bought, how much drink was drunk, and how much money was spent. The other thing about lords is they were important people, and that meant that they had paintings of themselves made. But more than that, they might have had songs of their exploits written. They might have had stories commissioned telling what their lives involved. We today, in our very sophisticated present, have something similar, except the best I can manage is some old photographs of my family above my fireplace that I had made at Kmart in the 1990s. I certainly don't get the oil painting treatment that someone like Thomas Fiennes, the ninth Baron Dacre of the South, would have had. So, what about the castle? What was daily life like for the people in Hurstmansu Castle? Well, here I have a map of the castle and what the castle was like in the 1600s, perhaps the late 1500s. This isn't necessarily accurate. This particular map was commissioned in the early 18th century, that's the early 1700s. The castle was going to be turned into a ruin and they were going to have the castle stripped and use things like the doors, the staircases, the uh, wood paneling uh, stripped out, and even some of the bricks, and used to build a modern mansion house about a mile away, half a mile away. As parts of that record-keeping process, a map and plan of what the castle had looked like was commissioned because they knew that historians and antiquarians of the future would want to be able to look back. So this is an example of early salvage ethnography, record keeping retrospectively to make it clear what things were like at some point in time. Now, we in our homes today are constantly changing things. Most of us, if we have a house over a 25 year span, we might put in a new kitchen and we are rapidly changing our lived environment, our built environment. And it was exactly the same with people in the past that in the 1600s, when this particular version of the castle was around, there was also an, imp an, an impetus to be modern, to adapt, to make the house fresh. So even this map of what the castle looked like in the 1600s is an adaptation of what the castle had looked like in 1441 when it was built. So there were huge changes. Indeed, we know that the Dacre family lost much of their fortune when they were um, building the castle uh, and one of the young Dakers, he was arrested and put in jail and then executed, and the house and all of its titles were taken away. And for 20 years, the family was still living in the house, but in impoverishment. In the late 1500s, Queen Elizabeth returns the uh, family to their fortunes, and one of the daughters, I believe a Margaret Dacre, uh, puts a huge amount of money back into the castle to renovate it, make it seem very 
in New York. So even in the 1600s, it's already becoming a kind of false castle. But these records give us some idea of what life might have been like uh, for uh, people in the, certainly in the 1580s, 1600s. Now, one of the first things to notice are uh, the outside walls, the curtain walls, which we today use predominantly for our classrooms, uh, they were almost all service spaces. You can see on the left-hand side, on the left-hand curtain wall, there is a bakery, a laundry, uh, there is a kitchen, and there are a series of service spaces. Along the bottom row, we get guard rooms, we get bursar's offices, register's offices on the second floor, we have yeoman's offices. And really, medieval castle life was quite different from what we imagine the queen's life in Buckingham Palace. In fact, in the early period, uh, you'll notice in the middle of the uh, castle, there's a green court and a great hall. And indeed, most life was lived in the great hall. Everybody would sleep in the great hall, eat in the great hall. And it's not really until the 16th century that there's a sense of privacy and the noble family retreats further into the back of the castle into private chambers. So this map gives us a record of that time where we can see things like best bedchamber, uh, great parlor, little parlor, and we get a sense of the house no longer being just an administrative space, but it's a kind of comfortable family home. And that all exists in the back corner where you have things like um, the uh, chintz room and the drawing rooms. So again, lots of records of what life for a lord might have been like. However, what about ordinary people? What about the vast majority of the population who were peasants or serfs? What was their life like? And how could a historian know? If we already established that documents were a tool of people who had ownership of things, uh, what about people who owned nothing? What, what can we know about their lives? if they leave no historical record. Indeed, they had no contemporary record. They were keeping records of their lives. So if their lives were ephemeral, how can we look back to the past and piece together an understanding of what their lives might have been like? Well, we can use other primary sources. So I'm gonna use three main sources. The Matthew Paris itinerary, from London to Jerusalem, which was made in the 13th century. I'm gonna look at the Gough map of Great Britain in the 14th century. And then I'm gonna use a map of London from around the 1580s to see if we can get past what life was like for the very wealthy, look at what life might have been like for the very religious, and then look at what life might have been like for the very ordinary. So this is the Paris itinerary. It's a map, but it's a map that probably doesn't look like any map you've encountered before. The image on the left of your screen is a single page of the itinerary, which works from London all the way to Jerusalem. On this page, we get a trip from London, eventually to Dover, crossing the channel, and then going through France until we get to Reims. The image on the right is a close-up of uh, the journey from Canterbury to Dover. So in the bottom left corner, which I've highlighted, you can see an image, a symbolic image of London. The St. Paul's Church in the center, surrounded by a great wall. And of course, London was a walled city. The map then goes up, and then second from the top, we have Canterbury, and at the very top, we have Dover, which is represented with a castle, and behind it, 
some tumbling waves to signify the channel crossing. If we look closer at the map, we can see Canterbury is signified again by a walled city and Canterbury Cathedral in the middle. And we can see Dover is represented by a castle. You might notice, though, that the language on this map is French, and that tells us a great deal. So the journey time from Canterbury to Dover, it says Piet Trois Journées, three days by foot. It doesn't give us more detail than that, but we can see that it's three days by foot. Now, what if you're on horseback? Well, even people on horseback are traveling at the speed of walking because if they're going with an entourage, you go at the speed that the slowest walker goes. And so maybe a nobleman might be on horseback or in a carriage, but most people will be walking the journey. The language of French is an important clue as to who this map might have been made for. Paris was a medieval monk. And you would be right in thinking that he should be using Latin to create these texts. But if we go back to the Norman invasion, when William the Conqueror came into England, the Normans became the ruling class of the British Isle. And French becomes the language of the ruling class. So although this map is made within the church, it's using the language of the ruling class. That would indicate that Paris is creating this map for a nobleman. We can confirm that by taking a closer look at the map. You'll notice there's a considerable amount of gold leaf on the map. If we look closely at Canterbury and Dover, they are ringed with thin bands of gold. The use of dyes and color is also interesting. We have green and red, which are relatively natural and cheap to make colors, but we also have a striking use of pink and blue. And blue is a very difficult color to produce. You generally have to use chemical processes to get blue. And so the map really tells us that this was a lavish piece of work that wasn't designed to be folded up, and stuffed in a pocket, dropped into a puddle, or stepped on by a tired traveler. Rather, this map has a different purpose. It's a kind of imaginary journey that an aristocrat might take, a pilgrimage of the mind as they cross from London to Canterbury, over into France, heading through deserts, and finally working their way to Jerusalem, and imagining what kind of adventures they would have. So we can consider this map as a form of text that's designed to educate uh, a traveler, or a, a nobleman who's an imagined traveler, or to entertain. This next map has a very different purpose, however. This is a map of the British Isles. The first thing you might notice is it looks sideways to us. Now, of course, north is conventional. And when you're standing in a territory, you don't necessarily know what's going to be up. And in fact, there is no reason for us to think of north as up. That's something that we use as a common conceit we can't impose that on all historical periods. This map is quite different. There is no gold, there is no blue, there is no pink. Rather, it uses red and green, two natural colors that can be easily produced with vegetable dyes. This map also has an awful lot of detail on it. And if we move in closer, we can see that it has a large number of churches, cathedrals, and village parishes. If the previous map was a map of the mind, 
This map is a far more practical map, which can tell us not just that it's three days from Canterbury to Dover, but it also tells us exactly what we will pass on those three days. And perhaps a pilgrim who is making an actual pilgrimage now from London to Canterbury will need to know where all of the pilgrims rest are. So this map can tell us how to get from one place to another in three days journey and where you might stop along the way. You'll notice on this next map, it's much more crowded. And this is a map of London from about 1580. Now this map is actually a print from a copper plate. A copper plate means that you can put ink on the plate and lay a page down and get a copy in black and white of what was on that copper plate. This map was then hand colored after the details were captured by the printing process. This is the center of London and is a map predominantly of the square mile north of the river and already it has north up in a way that we recognize. North of the river, and the river is of course the Thames, we have the city of London. South of the river, we have the city of Southwark. And you can see Southwark has a couple of round theatres. One, in fact, is a variating pit. You'll notice that while London is incredibly crowded, Southwark is much less crowded. And that can tell us what London might have looked like earlier, that presumably London was at some point much less crowded. And as more people move into the city, they begin filling in space. And we can see by using Southwark as a model, what London must have looked like in the early medieval period. In Southwark, we can see that much of the houses, if you look at the bottom of the screen, have little gardens. If you look north of the river, you'll see the gardens have been filled in with more houses. And to the right of the map, you can see some of the houses remain, still have courtyard gardens. And of course, as London gets more crowded, the whole city looks like the edge that runs along the Thames where all green space is filled in. But this map, if we look at the edges of the map, tells us what rural life in England might have been like for a medieval peasant. And we're going to use what is now Smithfield as a model to tell us what rural life across England in medieval villages might have been like. You'll see highlighted in yellow a row of houses, and they are adjacent to a large manor house, much like Hurstman Sioux Castle today. Behind the manor house, you have a series of square fields. One is an ornamental garden. Others are vegetable gardens, and there's an orchard. Lying just outside of that walled set of fields are more fields, and we'll see in those fields animals representing that these are fields for pasture. Now, a lord would own a considerable amount of land, and indeed, we at Hurstmansu Castle still own 600 acres of farmland around. We own it, but others work it. And that is a carryover of a medieval financial model. If we look at the map, we'll notice that around the manor house, and here's a close in of the manor house, there are all kinds of little cottages. You'll notice in the far right top of the map, there's a line of cottages. Now, we think of life of a peasant as probably pretty horrible. 
but it's not entirely bad. You'll notice those cottages all have a little courtyard garden. So the villagers would be able to grow their own food. Not only can they grow their own food, you'll notice that they have access to these fields with uh, animals. And the villagers might have a small flock of sheep. The lord of the manor has a kitchen garden, an orchard, a courtyard garden, but he wouldn't work that garden. Rather, two days of the week, the villagers work the lord of the manor's gardens for him. They do that in exchange for being allowed to live on his land for what was known as a peppercorn rent, a small amount of money as a rent, and they repay the Lord in labor. Further, the peasants might have a flock of sheep. In order to be allowed to have those sheep, they would return some wool or some lamb to the Lord as a form of tax. The peasants work the land, but a farmer is actually a tax collector. And the farmer manages all of the fields and all of the labor and all of the tithe, all of the tax that has to go back to the Lord in return for the peasants staying on the land. Now, this means that life for a peasant might not have been so bad. Fresh air, countryside, food, and two days of the week, they have to work for someone else. But five days of the week is their own time. So using a medieval map, we can actually start to conclude quite a lot of what life might have been like for those invisible people. So the value of primary sources, this 100 is an unusual course in that first year students begin working with primary sources in the first week of term. We use artifacts that are drawn from the castle's own archives, as well as the British Library, the British Museum, the Imperial War Museum, the Canadian War Museum, and much, much more. And we use three different methods of history. The first method of history is a kind of military political. What was life like for those at the top? Important people who made important decisions. And that's a history from above method. Winston Churchill made this decision. Napoleon did this. The second order of history that we use is a social history. That's history from below. If the people at the top made these decisions, how did it impact those below? If a lord had a life that involved extravagant expense, lavish feeding, and the labor of hundreds, what was life like for the hundreds below? And we can call that a social history. What was daily life like? A third order of history is a social cultural history. By looking at everyday objects that people had in their houses, in their lives, we can ask the question, but where was I? in this. If I am not an aristocrat, and I am not a peasant, but rather I am somewhere in the middle, where was I in the past? Or perhaps we might have an identity that is driven by our gender or sexuality. And we could ask questions like, okay, I'm a young woman. What was life like for young women in the medieval period. Or we might ask the question, okay, but I have a particular religious identity. What was life like for the very religious 
in the medieval, the medieval period. And so by asking these questions, where was I, and looking at the daily culture of people, we can start answering some of these questions. And that's why using artifacts and archives is so important to us as historians. So here's a question. First, as people who have gone through Queens and are graduates of Queens programs, what experience do you have with working with primary sources? Have you looked at these documents, these texts, these objects in the past before? And the second question is, how will our material culture, the stuff in our houses, inform future historians. If a historian 200 years from now looks at a Google map, what values does that Google map give of us? Well, the number of petrol stations or gas stations that are flagged on Google maps gives a fairly strong indicator about our dependence on fossil fuels. The laying out of roads rather than churches tells us about our dependence on the car as a means of transportation. I mentioned that the, um, I mentioned that the, uh, Medieval map would tell us that it's a three day journey by foot to get from one space to another space. But what about us and our relationship to distance? If time is no longer a factor, you can see in our maps how our families are spreading out. And maybe we have family that lives two hours drive away rather than a 20 minute walk away. And so we can see how the car has shaped our experience of the world, our understanding of life. So think about what you have in your house. Our carpets made out of petroleum products, our clothes, the fibers often made out of petroleum products, our plastic bags and our plastic lives made out of petroleum products. And future historians will be able to see how petrochemicals are such an important part of our lived experience. But what other stuff do we have that shows our values? Televisions, perhaps, and our need to be connected and see what's happening in the world. Computers and communication technologies and our need to be connected and understand what's happening in the world. And how does that differ from people of two generations ago or three generations ago? Do we still have pianos in our houses or are those an object of the past where music making is created by machine rather than by people? So how will our material culture, the stuff in our houses, inform future historians? So thank you for your time. Uh, I have put aside 10 minutes for a Q&A. I do apologize. I see some comments saying that the sound is quite, there's a, a strong echo. Uh, I don't know why that would be different today than yesterday. Um, but if you need me to repeat something, I'm more than happy to repeat something. So, Duncan, will they be able to ask a question on screen or with questions in the Q&A? Um, okay. Great. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Absolutely. So does anybody have a, a question about the BISC 100 course or about our working method of working with primary sources? Was everyone able to hear everything that I was saying well enough? 
So I have a question, how much work do students do in the field, i.e. geography and history? Um, that's a very good question. So the course covers geography, but it is urban and cultural geography rather than um, physical geography. Uh, so we do talk about landscape as a kind of uh, signifying structure. What does the landscape tell us about us? Um, and the students do a huge amount of field work, but probably not in the way that you're imagining. So we might take the students to something like the National Gallery, where they'll look at paintings by J.M.W. Turner or Constable. And they had a very bucolic image of England, uh, Turner often because he was copying Constable. And what they did was they construct England as uh, in the William Blake poem or the song Jerusalem presents as a green and pleasant land. Now, uh, in this week's class, for example, we're going to ask the question, how is it that the country's national memory sees it as a green and pleasant land when someone like William Blake describes the country as being uh, filled with dark satanic mills? And there's a kind of um, duality between England being an industrialized and industrializing nation of big urban centers and an imaginary England, which is a green and pleasant land of gentle rolling hills. And so we look at uh, landscape and we do field work with landscape in those terms, but that's uh, in accordance with a kind of urban cultural geography. We also look at the landscape of the immediate environment. And so the students will be taken out into the grounds where they will walk around the castle and we'll talk about the landscape has shifted and changed. So one of the things that people today don't necessarily recognize is that um, the castle was a seaside castle when it was built. And the ocean was very important to um, life in the castle. And yet now we're a good 15, 20 miles away from the sea. Uh, so we look at how the geography has changed, but broadly at how that impacts memory, questions of identity and questions of um, cultural imagination. But that's an excellent question, I think. We have a question from Kathy Wilde. I understand that cursive writing may no longer be taught in grade school, how do you feel this will impact our future abilities to appreciate primary sources? And that's an excellent question. So last week, we were looking at letters and diary entries during the Second World War. Um, and as a way of understanding um, the tensions and anxieties of the war on the home front, we were looking at primary sources from a first-hand nature. And these aren't typed, they're handwritten. And being able to read and interpret handwriting is a real challenge for students today. But something being challenging isn't a good reason not to do it. And although handwriting isn't taught to the same degree that it was, it is taught sufficiently that people are aware that there is a thing called handwriting and different modes of it but there is no question that students find it hard. But that's also part of the beauty of primary research. We've become a very fast nation, a fast society, but we also want learning to be fast. But primary research is a slow process. It means pouring over hundreds, if not dozens of letters. And it means familiarizing yourself with the language of cursive writing in the same way that um, as the students progress, they will become familiar with perhaps Latin terms. Uh, and more importantly, uh, the way English was written um, in earlier times. So Kathy, if you are interested in Google, there is a recipe book from the medieval period called The Form of Curry. And even though it's not handwritten, it uses a kind of medieval shorthand prepared by the cooks, and all kinds of terms 
that we might not be familiar with in culinary practices today. So uh, a recipe for a chicken stew is take a capon, smite him into pieces, have water until it is seething, uh, and then cast into the pot. Uh, and so, you know, this will always be a problem. How do you interpret things from a very different uh, life uh, that uh, we live today? So that will always be happening in terms of education. I have another question from Andrew Boggs again. A fascinating talk. By the way, very much enjoyed living in a former market garden outside Twickenham and an archival historian in my own academic work. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, Naomi Fruman asks, how does this course adapt from year to year? Uh, Naomi, I remember you. Uh, and uh, there has been changes, certainly. Um, the course is developed by a team, and the team personnel does change from time to time. Uh, so I was um, talking with uh, one of my colleagues just before we came on. Uh, when the course was first conceived, there was uh, myself, uh, a medieval historian, a geographer, um, and somebody from uh, developmental studies uh, who was also sociology. Um, and we developed the course using Queen's Department content as well uh, to create a course that you know reflected our specializations. Um, over the years, uh, somebody gets replaced. The medieval historian was replaced with a 20th century historian. So we uh, put more emphasis then on the Second World War and the First World War. And of course, last year there was a pandemic. And in the pandemic, we went entirely online. And we were doing the same course, but to students remotely in a form of it like this, uh, although not from the castle, from you know, my, my bedroom. Um, but that meant we had to reconsider how the content was delivered. And that actually gave us an opportunity to make even more use of primary sources because to offset for the fact that we weren't in the classroom with students, we could have more students go to the Imperial War Museum archives, more students go to the British Library, more students go to different historical primary source texts. This year we've kept on a lot of that method and we are broadcasting the course while we do it live in the classroom with students. So we have a dedicated classroom that has a setup similar to this with cameras and computers uh, and a big screen where I can see all the online students. And so there are 35 live students and 15 online students working together. And it means they can even do group work together. So distance learning has been very much changed by the pandemic. And we're now developing a hybrid model that allows for a combination of uh, distance and live learning uh, at the same time. So in synchronicity rather than uh, asynchronously. And that's going to be a huge change. It does look like we are in our last minute. And I believe that the uh, window will close. So I do want to finish up uh, appropriately rather than just being terminated and cut off. Uh, please feel free to follow up with me about any of the topics that we've discussed using the email address, which Duncan will put into the chat. It is highlandr at queensu.ca. And so Duncan will put my email into the chat, highlandr, H-Y-L-A-N-D-R, at queensu.ca. Uh, and I'm happy to continue this discussion. Um, Naomi, it's fantastic to see you again. Uh, and thanks again, everybody, for coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the homecoming.